and we're going to talk a little bit about meningiomas. And for those who are trainees, and those of you who are not neurosurgeons or well-versed in this, uh, meningiomas are actually one of the most common brain tumors. They're, they're right up there neck and neck with glioblastoma. Uh, meningiomas are very, very common tumors. And they arise from arachnoid cap uh, cells. And this is one of these tumors that I, I had uh, the challenge of removing. And these tumors are typically slow-growing, benign tumors which is why I think sometimes they don't get the same attention and focus as cancer, because meningiomas are typically not cancer. There's grade one, grade two, and grade three, and the vast majority are grade one and two, and so they are not typically given the same interest and focus. But just because they're benign doesn't mean that they can't cause problems. And so they're a really interesting challenge for us as surgeons, as neuro-oncologists, radiation oncologists, as a community to uh, focus and train. So the three parts of my story actually started a while back, looking at how to personalize neurosurgery for patients with meningiomas. And this story started with a project that I was working with, with Neil Martin, on surgical theater, using virtual reality to look at this meningioma. And I want you to keep this meningioma and this video in mind, I'll play it again later, is that just as technology in our lives are improving, we're not using things like virtual reality and augmented reality in our technological lives every day. You know, I, I, as Dr. Paradian mentioned, I did bring my, my second daughter with me, and, and they play games, things like Pokemon Go. Have you heard of this? Pokemon Go is really just augmented reality, is in, injecting technological space into real-time space. And so when we worked on this project five, seven years ago, with Dr. Martin, we were looking at the virtual reality applications of how to approach a tumor like this and how we can use it best for education. Because if you look at someone like a skull-based surgeon like Dr. Liao or Dr. Bergschneider, Dr. Everson, Dr. Kim, they don't need to look at this. They've done these tumors, they've done these surgeries. This is just watching a virtual reality of some video of some real, it would be like you in a driving simulator. You're like, I don't need this, I drive. I drive a real car. But could this be useful for someone who's never driven before? You betcha. And I think that's where the future for virtual reality is going, is towards education. And this is a paper that you can look up as we looked up the virtual reality applications in education. And the next wave is going to be augmented reality. Right now, augmented reality, this projects on the Kinevo, the Leica, in Magic Leap. It's coming to affect our education. But I wanted to pause on this one meningioma, look at this meningioma, and I thought, what can I learn? What's the technological space that I can learn? Because when I look at this and I use a virtual reality, I look at this and say, okay, this gives me a bifrontal approach. I see the blood vessels. Is there something that I'm missing? And the thought that comes to my mind, frankly, is looking at the two anterior cerebral arteries thinking, am I gonna have blood loss? Is this gonna need a transfusion? And do I need to embolize? Those are the questions sitting in my head late at night after I put my kids to sleep going, how do I approach this? And so the first thing we, we wanted to do was look at this using blood transfusions. Is this tumor going to need blood transfusion? So we looked at the meningiomas that we did here at UCLA between 2013 and 2017, and we looked at all their transfusion status, and here's the data points, and all these are part of your uh, syllabi, so you can look at the data later, and it's also been published. And we looked at their transfusion protocols, and this is actually a very unique problem to look at. Because you can't just give them a transfusion and look at them weeks and weeks later. There's a time period, and are they checked for their transfusion response? So we put all this data into the computer to say, which are the patients that need to be transfused? And typically, we teach our new doctors, our residents who are in the audience, that you need to transfuse to a hemoglobin target of either nine or 10, and a, a, a hematocrit of 27 or 30. Those are the numbers that we use. Well, when we're looking at this, we realize that for meningiomas, there are two numbers that matter, five and 10. That if the meningioma is approaching five centimeters or greater, or if your surgery is approaching 10, 10 hours or more, your risk for a transfusion starts going up very dramatically. And I know what you're telling me is, Isaac, that's not earth shattering at all. Big tumors, long surgeries, they're gonna require transfusion. Yes, I agree, this is not earth shattering. We're trying to quantify this, saying if the tumor is approaching five centimeters, 
or greater than 10 hours, your risk for transfusion is going up. That these are the things that we need to start thinking about. When I talk to the anesthesiologist and say, well, this is a five centimeter tumor, there's a pretty good chance we're gonna have to transfuse. That these become quantifiable. And that as we put these data points into a computer, and as we collect more data, these specific granular details are gonna become more and more clear to us in the next 10, 15, 20 years. That it will change the way that we treat our patients. And so we looked at patients who were older, patients who had longer, uh, larger meningiomas, longer operative times, lower post-op hemoglobins, uh, and we found that the risk factors for transfusions were age, the, the hemoglobin, some skull-based tumors, and we found that skull-based tumors by themselves, skull-based meningiomas, raise your risk for transfusion. And that these outcomes were complicated by, if you transfuse a patient, you're gonna end up with a longer, uh, uh, length of stay, and more likely a non-routine discharge. And we published this trans, uh, publication in the uh, Clinical Neurology and Neurosurgery, so if you'd like further details on the 5 and 10 rule, uh, this is where you can find it. But then the last thing came to, okay, so I look at a tumor, I can look at it through virtual reality, I can figure out whether or not the odds of transfusion, nothing to, the, to this point is really earth-shattering. But what can I do if I see that this is a big tumor or if this is some sort of tumor, how can I prepare? How can I teach future doctors and residents how to prepare for this? And I trained at UCSF uh, with Dr. Berger, Dr. Parsa, and when I first came to UCLA with Dr. Martin, we embolized very, very liberally. It, it was, you have a meningioma, we'll do the angiogram and we'll embolize. It, it was an embolization uh, galore. We embolize a lot. At UCSF, it was extremely liberal. And when I first got to UCLA, we also embolized very liberally. And the question was, if this tumor is five centimeters and the transfusion risk is high, should I be embolizing all these patients? A relatively simple question. And I wanted to see, can we try to embolize this patient? Well, I, I was a little bit inspired by my friend Chris Ames, who came to UCS, uh, UCLA and gave his uh, grand rounds. And this is courtesy of Chris Ames. This is his exact slide. And he said that there's machine learning coming in the future, machine learning. He said there was a TED Talk. Of course, Chris doesn't read the papers. He just talks about the TED Talk. He said there's a TED Talk. And they were, the TED Talk speaker was talking about breast cancer. And they put in all this information into deep learning and a computer. And the computer came up with 12 structural predictors of breast cancer. And this is his slide, and this is Chris's punchline. But the doctors, the pathologists, they only knew about nine. They put all the data into the computer, and it came out with 12 data points. And the pathologist only knew nine. This is from Chris Ames. Me being uh, the brain tumor and the big nerd I am, I said, that's a great TED Talk. I listened to it, and I said, I need the source paper. And this is the source paper. This paper is actually from USC. I know, I'm the UCLA neurosurgeon quoting USC. This is the USC paper on breast cancer from Dr. David Aegis' lab, looking at the big data saying, this is the computer recognizing, this is the computer recognizing some things that the doctor and the pathologist and the human eye doesn't naturally pick up that there were 12 very important markers and only nine of them were well known by the pathologist. And so then I went back to my problem and said, if there is something here, if there is a meningioma that I can see, I can analyze with voxels and computers and all this stuff and rotate in three dimensions and in craziness, how will this help us, help us in terms of surgery? And so when we come back to this scan again and come back to this imaging, and we look at this meningioma and we say, this is complicated and, and this is so cool. When, when I show this, I, I always go, look, this is like Star Tours. Remember the ride at Disneyland? I don't know if it's still there, but there's a ride that you simulate. You can pretend that you're a brain surgeon and I wish surgery was like this sometime with no brain. And you may think that I have no brain right now, but there's no brain, just blood vessels and here's a tumor. What can we do? What's the next level beyond this? And can the computers can the semi-automation and can the computer segmentation help us with this approach? 
and it can, obviously. So this is semi-automated segmentation. Here's that exact same tumor. I wanted to put these two videos side by side so that you can see this computer analysis. How does the computer see this tumor? Not with feeling or with my, my biases, but with algorithms and numbers and voxels. And so the computer now is looking at this tumor. The computer is segmenting this with my suggestions. So what I have to do is say, here's the tumor, this is the tumor uh, enhancement, and now the computer is looking at this, uh, at this tumor, and the tumor with this software will now tell me where the blood vessels are on this tumor. And so if we can see how many blood vessels are on this tumor, and we take all the blood vessels and we make it a volume, cubic centimeters, and we divide it by the total volume of the tumor, could that come up with some sort of vascular predictive number? And obviously I'm leading you to the question and the answer, which is yes. And we called this number the meningioma vascularity index. And so we went over, and when I say we, I'm really talking about my resident, postdoc, and medical student, went over and with the computer segment automation, and a lot of this actually uh, with Luke McQuaggian and Bill Waj, uh, also in UCLA Neurosurgery, we looked at this and said, could this give us numbers? And, and these are examples, and, and this sounds really you know, far-fetched, but I want to bring it down to the neurosurgical level. I want you as doctors and clinicians to say, this isn't just a fancy research project. This is very, very real. And so we did a volumetric analysis of the flow voids using T2, using the MRIs that you get at your hospital. This is not a specialized uh, MRI. This is just the brain lab stealth MRI that you get, a routine T2, and the ITK SNAP software, which is a freely downloadable software that you can use to do the uh, segmentation, and you get results like this. So this is an intraventricular tumor in the right frontal uh, horn. And it, when you look at this, I can't really tell. Is this going to be a tumor that needs to embolize? Is this a tumor that's approaching five centimeters? It's probably going to need a transfusion. This tumor is deep, so it's going to probably take eight to 10 hours. Am I going to need a transfusion? But when you look at it from the computerized, when you look at it from a numbers-based perspective, the MVI, the meningioma vascular index for this, was less than 2.5 cc, less than 2.5. So when we found that the MVI was less than 2.5, this is the kind of tumor that probably did not need embolization. On the next tumor, though, this one is a left atrial horn meningioma. And when I look at those two meningiomas, frankly, before this study, I wouldn't be able to tell them significantly apart. I'd say the bleeding risk is roughly the same in the two. But based on this software, based on the computer analysis, the MVI for this one was greater than 2.5. And that became our cutoff, 2.5. And that this is stuff that you can do on your computer at home. It doesn't require anything special. That you can look at this, do the segmentation, and that if this MVI on this tumor was greater than 2.5, this is a tumor that would be beneficial to embolize. Would this work? And again, this is also for sphenoid wing meningioma that we did surgery on. Left sphenoid wing meningioma, here's the tumor. It's fairly largeable, and you would make the guess that this is going to be vascular, and indeed this was greater than 2.5. And so what happened to these patients based on MVI? When you looked at it, not based on any other way to dissect the patients, but just looking at their tumor and their MVI status. And so this is the details of that study. Uh, these are the age range between 31 and 81. Uh, most of these patients were female, as you would expect uh, in a uh, meningioma cohort. And that the average MVI was about 1.3. And that the key grading score here was if the MVI was greater than 2.5, that it correlated with the ability to control intraoperative blood loss. Intraoperative blood loss was controlled for with embolization. And this was the scattered plots of those MVIs compared to estimated blood loss during those surgeries. And that if you embolize these cases, they showed us which patients were best treated with an aggressive, invasive procedure like angiogram and embolization. And that the MVI suggests we can determine which patients. And this changed my practice personally is that I do not 
liberally and, and without question embolize all large meningiomas anymore is that we do this ITK SNAP software, we look at the MBI, and we determine whether or not these patients need to be embolized. And this, um, I think, was just published in the last six months now in the Journal of Neurosurgery, uh, looking at meningioma vascularity index, that this volumetric analysis of flow voids is a way to predict intraoperative blood loss, how vascularized these tumors are. And it aims to tell us which of these tumors may be best assisted whose outcomes may be best help for the surgeon if we embolize these tumors. And I think this is really, really exciting, not for this one specific thing, because I don't think that by itself is earth shattering, but the application of computer learning and segmentation to our specialty. I, I'm the UCLA neurosurgeon that was quoting USC. I'm gonna go one step further and now quote Stanford. This is from uh, looking at a Stanford algorithm that was looking at chest x-rays that the machine learning, computer learning was better at diagnosing pneumonia than the, than the radiologists were, that the computer's eyes were becoming better than our eyes. And I stop here because I think in the real world out there, it's gonna to apply to things like Uber and Lyft, Waymo, the self-driving car, Tesla, that th these things are coming down the line. Uh, I, for full disclosure, drive a Honda 2011 CRV. But these self-driving features are coming down the, feature, down the road. And you may think, look, I'm going to push back on you, Isaac. That's no way. I do brain surgery. I do neurosurgery. I put in my pedicle screws, and I do the craniotomies. No computer can ever come to replace me or assist me. And I, I, I'm just daring you to realize, actually, computers are already invading and invading and pushing and assisting you all the time. And I, the reason why I put this one up is, except for the residents, for those of us who are older in the room, way back when you were 16, 17 years old and you were learning to drive, and you saw a big rainy day like today in LA, and you had to stop, they taught you to pump your brakes. Do you remember this? They'd pump your brakes, put your legs down, pump, 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 pump. They said, do not slam the brakes or your car's gonna do something bad. I, I don't know what, uh, that's what they said. But when my young daughter, who's gonna to learn to drive, or, or maybe not drive at all, but when they teach driver's ed today in 2019, they teach the drivers what? You pump your brakes. When you all drive home today in your cars, you slam the brake as hard as you can. Why? There's something called anti-lock brakes. And anti-lock brakes is a computer that is pumping your brake faster than you possibly could with your leg. The computers are coming. And as they assist you in the way to drive, they are assisting us in neurosurgery, neuro-oncology, critical care, in medicine to change the way that we approach uh, our field. Uh, I want to thank all, my entire team that helps us uh, do all this work. Uh, it could not be done without them. Everyone in the UCLA Brain Tumor Program and everyone here at UCLA Neurosurgery, I'm so proud to be part of the team and to represent. And if you have any questions, you can always feel free to call me. That is my cell phone number if you text it. Someone always does just to test, and it is. And my email address, um, and if you want to find me on Facebook, Instagram, Google, however you want, patients find me. I can show you the patients that find me on Twitter or on Instagram. I don't know why, but they choose to do so. And uh, I want to thank uh, my wonderful family, including uh, my daughter, Lily, who was the only one who wanted to come and listen to this boring talk. <laughs> thank you.